Right, I'm not sure where to start. I think I can start with a bit of a bit of a snapshot in a nutshell, like how did Paul Weber racing end, end up here and where did it all start from? Uh, it ended up here because um, my A-level results were so poor that there weren't many alternatives. Um, and then my father was training here and then I was, um, I rode and was champion amateur and did silly things like that for a while. And then ended up in Newmarket. Um, I wanted to be assistant trainer to Sir Michael Stack. And I went for my interview and it all went pretty well. And Sir Michael said, yep, that's fine. You can join us in November. And I was so excited. By the time I got to the door, he went, oh, Bondi Bob, oh. Um, he said, I just must check one thing, that one of my men who comes in the summertime doesn't want to stay on for the winter. And it was Fanshawe. Oh, no. So Fanshawe and Ferguson had the job. Oh, no. And so I couldn't work for Sir Michael, but ended up with Jeremy Hindley and had a fantastic time there. And then Johnny Harrington asked me to join CBA. And the Club Ross Agency see Newmarket. And then David Minton left that. So I ran that office until 95 when Dad died and came back here to property law. Okay. That's the nutshell. And then have been here ever since. Yeah. And highs and lows, what have been the, the biggest uh, achievements of your career? Well, it's taken 25 years, but the last race at the Cheltenham Festival meeting that didn't happen, <laughs> that shouldn't probably have happened due to oh, coronavirus, God. was indefatigable getting up by a short head. So that was one of the biggest thrills. And I think probably two Royal Ascot winners. Okay. Because we love training as many faculties as we can get as well. And uh, I think probably Yulundi, Yulundi winning at Royal Ascot, and then just getting beaten two short heads in the head in the Arlington Million. Wow. The race all family know very well. Yeah. And I was out there with Ptolemaio in those days, no with, with Muscatite running against Ptolemaio. So we always love going to uh, Chicago. And uh, for a Scottish champion, Erdl winner to nearly get win the million was quite good. That's amazing. That is amazing. Wow, what a story. Cool And tell me about this place because you've got some incredible facilities. Yeah, well, this it started when Dad moved to, to farm in 1955 and always had a broodmare and a, a sort of a point point horse and things like that. And then when he packed up riding, when my brother Anthony had his first ride, they rode the same race. Um, he, um, one or two people said to him, would you train a horse with me? And so gradually it built up to 30 box yard. And then he died in 95 and we've added on to 60 boxes in the pool and everything you see now. Yeah, but it's, it's wonderful. Um, is he going to get teeth decayed? Yeah, quite. Might well do. I will. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever test them for holes in their teeth? We have, our, dentist, our dentist hasn't complained. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, and what, are the, what, what would you like to achieve still? Uh, I'd love to win the July Cup. Right. It's a race that's always just very, like really so exciting. Uh, and the Cheltenham Gold Cup would do. I guess okay. those two. Just a couple. And uh, we've had winners in France and Spain, and uh, we'd like to try and do a bit more of that too, particularly prize money as it, as it is. Um, but we're just, I think this is a, to run a happy ship where the people are happy, therefore the horses are relaxed. And if the horses are relaxed, they'll eat more and you can train them harder. And to try and keep that going, you just get better animals. And it would be some achievement to see this guy back at all back on a race course. Well, right? exactly, and we're all right at the moment, but as we know, every day closer to the race gets more difficult. But it would be a good advert for the place and the swimming pool and everything if we could do that. 100%. And just quickly tell me, Fairfax saddles, I've seen them a lot in use this morning. Yeah. Tell me about fantastic them. Fantastic stuff. We were very lucky to win a race at Hunting with a horse called Elite Guard, and the prize was a set of the Fairfax gear. And um, so we took it out of its box the next day and read all the science and watched the videos. And in about three weeks, within three weeks, that horse elite guard began to move better. His head came down, his stride got a bit longer, and we just saw a bit of difference. Okay. And so we talked to Vanessa and Rupert about it, and they kindly sent us a bit more kit. And it began to look better and better and make so much sense. Okay. And it's, it's the pad and the and the bridle and the girth and the saddle, the whole thing comes together. And we've seen a tremendous difference, no oh, doubt about it. And I've recommended it to John Gosling, he's now using the saddles as well. And it's beginning to move on into new market. Um, Alan King's using it as well. And it's good for the horse. Um, it's part of horse welfare, to be honest. Mm. And we were clearing out the tack room the other day, you know, during, did all the jobs during lockdown that you never do before. And the amount of old saddlery that came out of there and how frightening it looked now in the modern eye, you know, how they were made and how stiff the saddles were and these heavy leather girths and things like that. This is just 
moving with the times, and I'm sure it's the right thing for the horses. Yeah, and I get that a lot from looking around here, is that the horse welfare is, is yeah. the number one thing. Yeah, I think, well, it's crucial. It's, it's crucial. Yeah. That's why we all do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Pleasure, thanks. Come along and see us. No worries.